Chapter 15 of With Cortez in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 15 Again at Tezcuco. Until a late hour in the night, Roger sat talking to Cacama and his family, although they had heard from Bathalda all that had happened from the time of their leaving Tezcuco to their arrival at Slascala, he had to go over it again. Bathalda had told them that Roger had found a former acquaintance in Malincha, who was all-powerful with the white leaders, and Amencha asked many questions concerning her how roger had known her before and for how long what she was like and why he applied to her instead of going straight to the white general you have heard me speak of her before roger said in answer to the first question i told you that i had learned your language from a mexican slave girl who was one of my attendants during the time i was at tabasco she was with me the whole time i was there and if it had not been for learning the language from her and conversing with her i do not know how i should have got through the time i was sorry to leave her behind and promised her that if ever i got rich enough here i would send and purchase her freedom you seem to have taken a strange interest in a slave girl amentia said it was natural that it should be so princess I was little better than a slave myself. At any rate, I was a prisoner, and naturally took to the one person who was kind to me. We were companions and friends, rather than master and attendant, and directly I heard that she was with Cortez and had gained great influence with him, I naturally went to her. Is she very beautiful? I used not to think her beautiful at all when we were at tabasco together but she has changed greatly during the months that have passed since i saw her yes i think she is certainly beautiful now but not so beautiful as others i have seen but why did you go to her the girl again persisted because i cannot speak the language of the spaniards and it was necessary for my safety for them to believe that i am one of themselves rescued from some spanish ship cast by a gale on their shores when i was a little lad had i gone to cortez direct he would probably have guessed from my dress and from my speaking the language that this is how i came to be here but had i not seen malincha before i saw him she would have recognized me and would no doubt have told cortez that she had known me from the time i was cast ashore near tabasco somewhat over two years ago he would then have known that i could not be a spaniard for if so i could not in so short a time have lost my own language cacama now interposed and asked many questions about tlascala and its people some of the tlascalan princes and caziques gave their daughters as wives to the spaniards did they not six of them did so roger replied the ladies were first baptized into the christian religion and then married by the priests to as many of the chief leaders of the spaniards and what did you think of that cacama asked i did not think much about it roger said for it was no business of mine but that of the ladies and their friends it was certainly a politic course on the part both of cortez and the tlascalans and bound the alliance more closely together but methinks that upon such work as the spaniards are engaged in a man were better without a wife both for his sake and her own a man who goes into battle with no one but himself to think of may take joy in the strife for he knows that if he fails it makes no very great matter to any one but if he has a wife hard by who will be left a widow if he is slain it must be ever present to him while he is fighting 
and though he may not fight less stoutly, it must cause him grievous anxiety, and take away the pleasure of fighting. "'You have already told us that the white men are good husbands,' the queen said. "'I do not know that they are in any way better in that respect than your own people, Queen Maclutha. There are good and bad, men who treat their wives well, and men who neglect them. But you told us that they only had one wife each, she said, and that even kings are kept to this rule, as well as their humblest subjects. That is so, Roger said, one man, one wife, whatever his rank. There is no occasion for the palaces of our king to be as extensive as those of Montezuma. And if these officers who have married here were to return home, and leave their wives behind them, could they not marry again? No, Roger said, as the ladies have become Christians, and been married according to the rites of the church, they could not be lawfully set aside. And you have no wife in England, Roger Hopshaw, Kakama asked. Roger laughed merrily. Why, I was but a boy when I left home, and as far as marriage goes, I am but a boy still, we consider it young enough if we take a wife at five and twenty, and I lack six years of that yet. You are a man, Kakama said gravely. You are a man in size and strength, and a man in courage, as you well showed the other day when you were attacked by numbers of our best soldiers. You are thoughtful and prudent. Years go for nothing. You are a man, and even in years you are not according to our customs, too young to marry. Now tell me, we have heard much of that bad business at Cholula. Tell me, do you think that there was treachery on the part of the people, or was it a mere pretext of the Spaniards to fall upon the inhabitants and sack the town? I am sure that treachery was intended, Roger said. We learned it from three people, a lady and two priests and the Cholula nobles themselves, when taxed by Cortez with their intention to fall upon us, admitted that the accusation was true. Besides, the whole people were under arms and ready to attack, and poured out under their leaders to the assault, the moment the first gun told that their intentions were discovered. No, there is no doubt, whatever, that a general destruction of the white men was intended, and although the punishment inflicted was terrible, I cannot say that it was not justified under the circumstances. Moreover, we knew that there was a Mexican army lying but a short distance away in readiness to enter the town and join in the attack against us. It was a terrible error, as well as a crime on the part of the emperor, if it be true that he was concerned in it, Kakama said. If so, he took no one here into his council, but acted wholly on the advice of the priests. That is where the general considers the danger lies. He would trust the caziques, for men of rank in whatever country are faithful to their word, and do not pretend friendship when they mean hostility. Were Montezuma guided by them, there would be no fear of treachery, but as he has given himself to the priests, and they can— by means of the oracles, persuade him to almost anything, Cortes feels that the danger is great. Well, now, we had better to rest, Kakama said, rising. You are to start with the first streak of light, so as to be back before the sun is high, and it is long past midnight now. Cuicotl, it would, I think, be well for you to accompany our friend. A rumor may have got abroad that he is again our guest, and those who longed for his blood before may long for it again. I would not that he should cross the lake unattended. I was about to propose doing so, the young noble said. I know the priests, and can guess that, at present, a white victim is what they most of all desire. Therefore, I will certainly accompany him to Mexico. Roger and his Mexican friend were taken across the lake in a canoe, rowed by four strong men. It was one of the private canoes of the palace, without the royal insignia, used for the conveyance of messengers, and built for speed. She took them across to the capital in a very short time, 
and entering one of the canals landed them close to the palace occupied by the spaniards the sentry at the gate was surprised at the height of the young aztec chief who approached and did not recognize him until he spoke even then he would not let him pass until he called an officer i have been absent by the order of the general roger said i have no doubt it is all right the officer said but i must take you to him cortez had only just risen for the hour was still very early and the sun was but now showing himself over the mountains to the east he was taking a cup of chocolate that is all right he said to the officer as soon as he saw roger sancho has been absent upon my orders he then called malincha from an adjoining room you are back earlier than i expected he said as soon as the interpreter entered have you any serious news no general cacama is himself friendly he is unaware of any treacherous designs on the part of the emperor but admits that the situation is a critical one and that it is possible the influence of the priests may again induce montezuma to take a hostile action do you think we could count upon him as an ally i think not sir although i have not as yet sounded him cacama has been very badly treated by montezuma and he by no means approves of the emperor's conduct throughout this matter but i think that his patriotism would overcome his sense of private wrong i can tell you more farther on cacama has invited me to stay with him for the present and i think i might be of more use to you there than here i think so too cortez said and indeed you have not yet entered my band regularly like the rest it is right that you should have freedom of action especially as you are the only man among us who knows anything of the mexicans for even marina knows nothing of this side of the mountains don't you think that you will run great risk in staying there alone marina asked on her own account some danger no doubt malincha but i shall be on my guard and cacama will take precautions for my safety even the priests would not venture to seize me in his palace and the tezcucans are far less bigoted than the people of this city i do not think he will be in much greater danger there than he would be here cortez said when these remarks were translated to him we are all in danger we are sitting on a mine that may explode any minute the young fellow is sharp-witted and with his knowledge of the language and the people can be trusted to take care of himself sancho if anything should happen to us and you should hear that we have been destroyed i charge you to carry the news to the coast and to order in my name that all shall embark on board ship and sail to cuba it would be useless to try to maintain a foothold here spain would avenge it and with the ampler means than mine carry out the conquest of this country a few minutes later roger having said good-bye to juan and pedro and told them that he might be absent for some time started to tezcuco they had scarcely left the town when a canoe with six rowers issued from one of the canals and followed in their wake see they are after us cuitcatl said looking back doubtless the spanish quarters are closely watched to see who enter and leave them and the news that a tall young noble had entered was carried at once to the authorities and the boat was got in readiness to follow when you left and see who you were and where you were going however they will not overhaul us i bade the officer in charge of the canoes last night to pick me out four of his best men and in so light a boat we shall travel as fast as that behind us although they have two extra hands yes and they have four sitters roger said looking back no doubt they had orders to arrest you and bring you back they did not reckon on our speed the two extra men destroy their chances of coming up to us altogether row hard men i don't want that boat to overtake us the paddlers redoubled their exertions and the light boat almost flew along over the water for a few minutes those in the canoe behind also did their utmost but it was plain that they were falling behind rather than gaining 
Then one of the officials stood up and shouted an order for them to stop. They were some distance behind, but the words could be plainly heard. The Tezcucans looked scared as they heard the words, in the name of the emperor. Never mind them, Cuitcatl said. We are acting under the orders of our king. Besides, we are so far away that they cannot be sure their words are heard. If they have any complaint to make, they can make it to Kakama, and he will answer them. The boat was soon out of hearing of its pursuer, who fell farther and farther behind, and was a good mile away when they landed at Tezcuco. "'Run the boat up and lay her by the side of the others,' Cuitcatl said to the rowers. "'Then go at once to your homes, and say not to anyone about the journey you have made. The officials will find out what they want to know, as to whom we are, and will care nothing as to who were the individual boatmen who rowed us. Still, it is as well to keep silent. Of course, Roger, for the lad had asked him to drop the second part of his name, it will soon be known that you have returned here. With such numbers of persons in the palace, it cannot be hidden. Besides, you are well known by sight to most people in the town. I quite see that, Cuitcatl, and perceive no good in trying in any way to conceal myself. These long legs of mine cannot be got rid of, and tell their story too plainly. However, it makes no difference. I shall be safe in the palace, and shall only go abroad in the daytime. They will not venture to try to carry off, openly, one known to be under Kakama's protection. Kakama, on their return, agreed with Roger that it was of no use to try to conceal his identity, and the lad, after washing the stains from his face and hands, took his accustomed place at the banquet, and was greeted by many of his former acquaintances. After the meal, Kakama told him that, having heard from Bethalda of the wonderful shooting he had made with his great bow, he was desirous of seeing it, and that by his orders the forester, who had been sent for the evening before by Cuitcatl, had been directing some of the artisans to manufacture a weapon of similar strength. "'We will go and see how it is getting on,' he said. Proceeding to the workshops attached to the palace, they found that the bow was finished. It was constructed of a very tough but elastic wood. Three slips of this had been placed together and bound with sinews. Bethalda ran forward when he saw Roger, and taking his hand, carried it to his forehead. Roger shook the stout fellow's hand heartily. "'He is a brave fellow,' he said to Cuitcatl, who had accompanied them, and fought manfully and well. Had he not guarded my back during the fight, I should not be here to tell the tale now. We have made the bow according to our instructions, the head of the artisan said respectfully to the king, but it does not seem to us possible that anyone can use it. Three of us have tried to string it, but in vain. It is a good bow, Roger said, examining it. Do they shoot with weapons like that, over there? Kakama asked, nodding in the direction of Mexico. No, Roger said, for the most part they use crossbows, and their bows are much smaller than this. The English are the only people who use bows like this. They are our national weapons, and outside our island there are few, indeed, who can even bend them. As to the stringing, it is a knack rather than strength. See here, and taking the bow, which was just his own height, he placed his knee against it, bent it, and slipped the string into the notch with ease. Then, holding it at arm's length, he drew it till the string touched his ear. It is a great deal stiffer than that I made before, Bathalda, and is about the strength of those we use at home. Now for the arrows. These had been made by another set of men, and were an inch or two over a yard in length, with copper tips. While he was examining them, Kakama had taken up the bow, but though a strong and vigorous man for his race, he could bend it but a very short distance. It is a wonderful weapon, he said, and I should not have thought that mortal man, whatever his color, could have used it. Now let us go down into the practice yard. Cuitcatl, do you fetch the queen and her ladies to look on? I am no great marksman, prince, Roger said. 
I am, perhaps, somewhat better than an average shot, but I have seen marksmen who could do feats that I would not even attempt. They descended to the piece of ground where many of the young nobles were engaged in shooting and in practice with arms. Roger had often been there before, but had carefully abstained from taking any part in the mimic contests for he knew that men who are beaten sometimes feel malice, and he was anxious to keep on the best terms with all. Cuitcatl had often urged him to try a bout with himself or others with the sword, but this too he had always declined, and his friend had supposed that he was aware his skill was by no means equal to his strength. But now the Spaniards had proved to the Mexicans the fighting powers of white men, Roger had no longer any reasons for hanging back. As soon as he was seen approaching with Cacama, the Mexicans abandoned their sport and gathered round. The story of the defeat of a band of Montezuma's soldiers by the white man had been whispered abroad, and Cuitcatl had mentioned to his friends what he had heard from Bethalda of the mighty bow Roger had used. But when they saw the weapon with which he was now provided, their wonder was to a large extent mingled with incredulity. They passed it from hand to hand, tried but in vain to bend it, and murmured among themselves that the thing was impossible. "'What will you have for your mark?' Kakama asked. "'One of these targets will do well enough,' he said, pointing to those at which the Mexicans had been shooting. These were boards about five feet six in height and some fourteen inches in width presenting the size of a man. They were painted white and supported by a leg hinged behind them. The distance at which the Mexicans had been shooting was about forty yards. Roger stepped a hundred from one of them and made a mark upon the ground. An English archer would laugh at a target like that, he said to Cacama, but it is nigh three years since I practiced. I have seen men who could with certainty at this distance hit a bird the size of a pigeon, sitting on the top of that target twenty times in succession, and think it by no means extraordinary shooting. The queen and some of her ladies now appeared upon a terrace, looking down into the courtyard. Roger took the bow, fitted an arrow to the string, and drew it to his ear, a murmur of astonishment rising from the Aztecs. There was a pause for a moment, and then the arrow sped. There was a sharp tap as it struck the target, and stood quivering in it, just in the center line, about four feet from the ground. The bow is an excellent one, Roger said, and quickly discharged two more arrows, both of which struck within two or three inches of the first. As it was the power of the bow, rather than his own shooting, that Roger wished to exhibit, he now had the target removed a hundred yards farther back and others placed one on each side of it. At this distance he discharged three more arrows, shooting more carefully than before. All three struck the boards, although at varying heights, and a shout of surprise arose from the lookers-on. "'How far will it carry?' Kakama asked. "'It might carry another hundred yards, but the aim cannot be depended upon at over two hundred yards, even by good shots,' Roger said." of course the longer ranges are useful for firing at a body of men i should say that large tree would be about the extreme range if you will send two men down to it i will see whether i can shoot as far we should not see the arrow from here will you tell them to stand one on each side of the tree but well away from it there is no saying where the arrow may go at this distance when two or three of the attendants had taken their places twenty or thirty yards from the tree, Roger drew the bow to the fullest, and, giving to the arrow the elevation he had been taught, as most suitable for an extreme range, unloosed the string. The arrow, which was of dark wood, glanced through the air. The eye could follow it only a short distance. No sound was heard this time, but in a few seconds the Mexicans were seen running towards the tree. Do not touch the arrow, Kakama shouted, and then, followed by the crowd, for the numbers had greatly increased as the news of what was going on had spread through the palace, 
he walked forward to the tree. The massive stem was more than four feet in diameter, and within a few inches of the center, and at a height of three feet from the ground, the arrow was sticking. The Mexicans were silent with astonishment, mingled with a certain amount of awe, for shooting like this seemed to them to be supernatural. "'And you said you were not a good shot,' the king said. "'It was a pure accident,' Roger asserted. "'I might shoot twenty arrows and not hit the tree again. "'I had not the least idea that I should do so. "'I only wished to show you how far a well-made bow could send an arrow "'when drawn by an Englishman. "'Cacama ordered the arrow to be left in the tree "'and a large stone to be placed at the spot from which Roger had fired.' they shall remain he said as a memento of this shot i will introduce among my people the custom which you say prevails in your country and every child shall be bound to practice daily with bows and arrows i do not think that any of our race will ever come to use such a weapon as that but they may at least learn to bend bows greatly stronger than those we are accustomed to use they will doubtless do so, Roger said. It is a matter of practice and of strengthening certain muscles of the right arm, for a man far stronger than I am would be unable to bend that bow had he not been trained to its use from the earliest age. I should recommend, Prince, that you not only give the order you have spoken of, but institute a monthly gathering with prizes for skill and honors to the best marksmen. In this way, all would take an interest in the sport, and it would become as popular among your youth as it is with us. Again Roger's bow was passed round. It had seemed to bend so easily in his hands that those who had not tried it before could scarce credit its strength until they had handled it. But even the most powerful men found that they could only draw the arrow a few inches as they walked towards the terrace upon which the queen and her ladies were standing cuitcatl said i had intended to ask you roger to try a bout of sword-play with some of us but i will not do so now after what we have seen of the strength of your arm i should be sorry indeed to stand up against you even with blunted weapons or with sticks for there would be no resisting a downright blow the news came to us of the terrible blows struck by the Spaniards, and how they clove through sword, helmet, and head. I scarce credited them before, but now I can well believe them to be true. Well, Maclutha, Kakama said, what think you of what you have seen? No wonder those who met with the white men in battle said that they had supernatural strength, and that even the sturdy Tlascalans could not resist them. We will have the bow hung up in the armory with a great gold chain, which shall be the reward of the first man who can, like our friend, draw the arrow to the head. It is wonderful, the queen said, and it would be well indeed if, as you say, the youth of Tezcuco could shoot like that. Amentia said nothing, but her cheeks were flushed with excitement and pleasure. That evening, when Kakama was conversing alone with Roger, he said, my friend, you know that the Tlascalan caziques have given their daughters as wives to some of the Spaniards. I was talking to you of marriage last night, and what you said about your age was ridiculous. You are a man and a warrior. I now offer you the hand of my sister Amentia. She loves you, as Maclutha and I have seen for some time. From what you said, I gather that your religion would not regard the ceremony as binding, did she not accept your god but i do not think she would raise any objection on that score seeing as we all do that your god has proved more powerful than ours roger was struck with astonishment at the offer he had regarded marriage as a matter not to be thought of for many years and until lately he would have said that if he ever did marry it would be the little cousin who had three years before said good-bye to him at plymouth but of late he had felt the charm of this beautiful little princess 
and since the night when she had come down to say farewell to him in the garden and he had felt her hand tremble in his and had seen a tear glisten on her cheek in the moonlight he had thought a good deal of her the chances of his ever returning to england were comparatively slight dangers of all kinds surrounded him the spaniards might be attacked and massacred at any moment and if so he would probably share their fate if however he was married to this mexican princess and a brother-in-law of the king of tezcuco he would be regarded as one of the people his position would be a high and honorable one and although his life would be far different from that to which he had hitherto looked forward it might be a very happy one he sat in silence for two or three minutes after cacama had ceased speaking and then said forgive me prince for not responding at once to an offer so far above my deserts and of the honor of which i am most deeply sensible there could be no greater happiness for a man than to be the husband of one so fair and in every way charming as the princess amentia but your offer came upon me altogether as a surprise as i have told you i have hitherto regarded myself as still a lad and marriage as an event not to be thought of for years but as you do not regard my youth as an objection there is no reason why i should do so it is of the future that i rather think it seems to me now that i could be content to settle down for life here with so charming a wife but i cannot say that i might always be of that mind the love of country is strong in every man and the time might come when if opportunity offered i might long to return home to england that i have talked over with the queen and with amentia herself cacama said my sister naturally would be sorry to leave her own country but if the time came that you should wish to return home she would not hesitate to make the sacrifice and to accompany you a mexican woman when she loves is ready to give up everything for a moment roger turned the matter rapidly over in his mind and saw that even were he disposed to refuse amentia's hand which indeed he was not it would be almost impossible for him to do so it would be a deep offence to this friendly prince it would be a cruel blow to the girl who had confessed her devotion for him as to dorothy she would have deemed him dead years ago and should he ever return he would find that she had long since been married for the daughters of the wealthy merchant diggory beggs would not want for suitors he held out his hand to the prince i accept most gratefully your offer cacama and promise that as far as in me lies i will do my best to render your sister happy and to prove myself worthy of her choice i am heartily glad the prince said warmly i love my sister and i have watched you closely i believe you to be worthy of her and i am sure that in you i shall find not only a friend and a brother but a wise counsellor and a valiant leader of my troops and that with your advice i shall be able to advance my people in the arts of peace as well as war and perhaps to win back my father's possessions as to the question of religion of which you spoke there is indeed no difficulty my grandfather the great nezahualcoyotl the wisest and most powerful of our monarchs did not believe in the aztec gods he built a great temple which he dedicated to the unknown god here he worshipped himself and did his utmost to induce his subjects to abandon the cruel worship of the aztec gods he forbade all sacrifices even of animals and permitted only flowers and sweet-scented perfumes to be offered up on the altars when after his death the aztec power increased and that of tezcuco diminished the people again embraced the cruel faith of the aztecs neither my father nor myself have been strong enough to set ourselves against the priests but he as well as i believed that my grandfather was right and that the unknown god is the ruler of the world my sister has of course been educated by the priests 
but she knows my father's opinions and my own she has a horror of the human sacrifices and believes that there must be a greater and better god than those who are said to delight in blood so you need not fear that she will make any difficulty as to accepting what you tell her of the white man's god now i will fetch her in to you i think it will be better to allow a short time to pass and to see how matters go in mexico before announcing to others your approaching marriage if any misfortune should happen to the spaniards i should at once publish the news and have the ceremony performed without loss of time proclaiming to the people that although white you are not of the same race as the spaniards if matters go on well montezuma himself will doubtless be present at his niece's marriage and i shall of course invite melanzin and all his officers the prince left the room and in a few minutes returned with his wife the latter leading amentia by the hand my friend roger hawkshaw the young king said gravely i hereby promise to bestow upon you the hand of my sister amentia may you find in her a good loving and obedient wife i on my part roger said taking the girl's hand which the queen held out to him promise to be a true and loving husband to her the girl who had not raised her eyes since she entered the room looked up at the tall figure with an expression of perfect confidence i will be true and obedient she said softly and will love you all my life what do you do next in your country cacama asked with a smile this is how an engagement is sealed with us roger said and drawing the girl up to him he stooped and kissed her lips three days later as roger was sitting with cuitcatl an attendant entered and said that the king wished to see them immediately they hastened to the royal apartment cacama was walking up and down with an angry frown upon his face while the queen and princess were sitting on the couch pale and agitated strange news has come from mexico cacama said the white men have seized montezuma and are holding him prisoner in their quarters did any one ever hear of such an outrage mexico is in a state of consternation but at present none know what to do it seems incredible roger exclaimed are you sure of your news quite certain the prince replied the news was indeed true cortez had found his position unbearable he believed that the attack upon the spaniards on the coast as well as the meditated treachery at cholula were the outcome of the emperor's orders his native allies had heard rumors in the town that the bridges across the canals were all to be raised in which case the spaniards would be prisoners in their palace he was in the mexican capital but he had as yet effected nothing towards the conquest of the country at any moment he might hear of the landing of an expedition from cuba that his authority was revoked and that another was to reap the benefit of all he had done he therefore called a council of his most trusted officers and discussed the situation with them all agreed that some step must at once be taken some were in favor of starting that night and making their way out of the city before a sufficient force could be collected to oppose their retreat while others were of opinion that it were better to retire openly with the consent of montezuma whose conduct since they had reached the city appeared to be most friendly cortez pointed out that both these methods would be retreats and the whole country would probably rise against them moreover even if they reached the coast they would have sacrificed all they had won by their valor and sufferings he proposed a measure which astonished even his boldest companions namely that they should go to the royal palace and bring the emperor by persuasion if possible by force if necessary to their quarters and there hold him as a hostage for their safety the proposal was agreed to and on the following morning cortez asked for an interview with the emperor which was at once granted he proceeded to the palace with his principal officers ordering the soldiers to follow in groups of twos and threes so as not to attract particular attention 
montezuma began to converse with his usual courtesy but cortez roughly cut him short and charged him with being the author of the attack upon the garrison at the port montezuma indignantly denied this and said that he would send at once and arrest the author of the attack cortez replied that it was necessary for their safety that montezuma should come and reside among them the emperor was thunderstruck at the proposal but the soldiers crowded in loud and threatening words were used and montezuma in fear of his life gave way had he possessed any of the courage with which he was credited in his youth he would have called his guards and nobles around him and died fighting having once given in he assumed the air of having done so voluntarily and ordered his litter to be brought in the meantime his attendants and the nobles who had been present had spread the news through the city the mexicans catching up their arms ran to the rescue of their monarch but the spaniards closed round the litter and had a blow been struck the emperor would doubtless have been murdered montezuma exhorted the people to be tranquil assuring them that he was going willingly and the mexicans accustomed to implicit obedience and fearing that harm would come to the emperor if a struggle began drew back and allowed the spaniards to pass and montezuma was conveyed a prisoner into the palace occupied by the spaniards the act was one of almost unparalleled boldness but as performed upon a monarch who was the host of his assailants and with whom they were previously on the most friendly relations it was an act of treachery and reflects dishonor upon the fame of cortez at the same time the position occupied by the spaniards was so strange and even desperate as to palliate though it cannot excuse such a course of action there is no reason to believe that montezuma intended to act treacherously but he was under the domination of the priests and had he again changed his mind as he had already several times done nothing could have saved the spaniards from absolute destruction no honorable man would have acted as cortez did but cortez was a rough soldier and moreover firmly held the doctrine at that time and long afterwards held by the spaniards in their dealing with those of other religions that faith need not be kept with heretics and heathen end of chapter 15chapter 16 of with cortez in mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah with cortez in mexico by george alfred henty chapter 16 a treasure room tis infamous cacama said as he paced up and down the room but what is to be done they hold him in their hands as a hostage in the heart of his own capital and among his own people and are capable of hanging him from the walls should a hostile movement be made against them you were right roger hawkshaw in warning us against these men they are without faith and honor thus to seize a host who has loaded them with presents who has emptied his treasuries to appease their greed and who has treated them with the most extraordinary condescension it is a crime unheard of an act of base ingratitude without a parallel what is to be done roger was silent such a situation so strange and unlooked for confounded him i should say cuitcatl burst out passionately that every mexican should take up arms and annihilate this handful of invaders what though montezuma fall better that a monarch should perish than a nation besides montezuma has shown himself unfit to govern it is his weakness that has brought things to this pass think you that the white men could ever have advanced beyond the plateau of tlascala had all the forces of mexico barred the way think you that they could ever have entered the capital had it been defended with resolution one moment he flattered the strangers 
and loaded them with gifts. The next, he was ready to send his forces against them. The Cholulans had good reason for believing that he designed the annihilation of the whites if he did not actually order the attack upon them. So on the seacoast had the chiefs believed that Montezuma was really friendly to the whites, would they ever have attacked them? There are two courses open. He might, from the first, have received the Spaniards frankly, and sent a mission to escort them honorably to the capital. Or he might have called upon every man in his dominion to take up arms and drive them into the sea. He took neither. It is he who has brought them here, and it is better a thousand times that he should die than that ruin should fall upon the country my advice is that the troops be called out that messengers be sent to every city in the valley bidding them send in their contingent and that we march to aid the people of mexico to annihilate this handful of treacherous white men cacama was silent the advice was in accordance with his own feelings and temperament but the extreme reverence with which the aztecs regarded their emperor paralyzed him we shall see he said gloomily in a short time we shall know why montezuma thus tamely submitted to be made a prisoner he may have some motives which we cannot fathom i cannot believe him to be a coward no aztec monarch yet has ever shown want of courage three or four days later another event occurred which heightened the fury of the mexicans against the spaniards the cazique who had attacked the spaniards on the coast arrived at mexico accompanied by his son and fifteen other chiefs who had acted with them montezuma referred the matter to the examination of cortez the cazique admitted the part he had taken in the attack on the spaniards and did not seek to shelter himself under royal authority until sentence of death was passed on him and the other chiefs when they all declared that they had acted on the authority of montezuma they were condemned to be burnt alive in the space in front of the palace and this sentence was carried out not content with this cortez placed irons upon montezuma himself saying there could now be no longer a doubt as to his guilt after the execution was carried out montezuma was released from his fetters the news of this insult to their monarch created a profound impression upon the mexicans although they despised the weakness of a sovereign who appeared ready to suffer every indignity and yet to claim an appearance of courtesy and goodwill towards his oppressors the bolder spirits determined that the nation should be no longer humiliated in the person of its sovereign and that even should it cost montezuma his life an effort should be made to overthrow his oppressors as soon as the news of the execution of the seventeen nobles and of the indignity to montezuma was received cacama said to roger my friend i can no longer retain you here you have told me why you cannot have it proclaimed that you are of different blood to the spaniards and i quite understand your motives but there are two reasons why in that case you must for a time return to the capital my people would look upon me with scorn did i retain here as my friend one whom they regard as the countryman of the men who have so outraged us moreover you yourself cannot wish to stay you have told me that cortez has charged you to acquaint him with the state of feeling in the city and were you to remain here you would be placed in the painful position of either giving information which would ruin my plans or of deceiving the man whom you nominally serve i know that you would say nothing against me but should i fail and the spaniards triumph cortez would accuse you of being a traitor and you would be put to death by him therefore i think it in all ways best that you should return there for the present you will of course inform cortez that i have sent you back because the feeling against the white men on account of their treatment of the emperor is so great that i felt i could not protect you against their fury 
i quite agree with you kakama my position here has become a very painful one i abhor as much as you do the doings of the spaniards and am perfectly ready to avow that i belong to another nation and to join you in an enterprise against them but that as you have told me kakama said would cut off any chance of your ever being able to return to your own country i am ready to accept that roger said firmly in marrying your sister i shall become one of yourselves and am ready to cast in my lot with you altogether the prince was silent for a minute or two no roger i think that my plan is the best were you to do as you say the spaniards would be at once placed on their guard while save by the strength of your arm you could aid but little in any enterprise against them moreover if you return to the spaniards i shall have the satisfaction that if i fall and ruin comes upon my house you will take care of my sister and that my wife will also have a protector for all reasons therefore it is better you should go but if aught is to be attempted against the spaniards i will take care to give you notice so that you can leave them in disguise and come here and so avoid their fate although roger's own feelings would have led him to throw in his lot openly against the spaniards he saw that kakama's plan was the best the boat was ordered to be at once got in readiness and after a painful parting with amentia who wept bitterly roger left the palace and again accompanied by cuitcatl in order to ensure his safety across the lake was taken over to mexico he at once sought the presence of cortez and though marina explained to him that cacama had sent him back fearing that in the excited state of the population harm might come to him he had since he had been in tezcuco sent a letter across each day to cortez saying that all was tranquil there that the young king was pursuing his ordinary round of court ceremonial and was certainly as far as he could learn taking no steps whatever towards interfering with the affairs of the capital although the imprisonment of montezuma had evidently made a painful impression upon him cortez asked him a few questions and when he left the room said to marina that young fellow must be watched marina he has been brought up with these people and must to some extent feel with them i know that he is a friend of yours but see that you say nothing to him on public affairs let him be kept wholly in the dark as to our plans and intentions this kakama is next to montezuma the most powerful and important of the aztec chiefs he is young and energetic and although he has been so badly treated by montezuma he resents our treatment of him had it been otherwise he would probably ere this have made some propositions to us through sancho for a closer alliance with us on the understanding that the territories montezuma has taken from him shall be returned we must have cacama's actions closely watched there are other aztecs who are willing enough to act as our spies and who will keep us informed of what is going on hitherto their reports have agreed with sancho's but from his sending the young fellow back here cacama may now be intending to act against us cacama indeed lost no time in setting to work and began to form a league with many of the leading nobles to rescue the emperor and destroy the spaniards montezuma's brother cuatlahua and many others agreed at once to join him but the greater part of the aztec nobles hung back upon the ground that they did not like to move in the matter without the orders of their emperor their refusal prevented any general rising taking place and thus destroyed the last chance of mexico retaining its independence cortez learned from his spies what was going on and would have marched against tezcuco had not montezuma dissuaded him telling him that cacama was a powerful prince and would certainly be aided by many other chiefs and that the enterprise would be hazardous in the extreme cortez then endeavored to negotiate but received a haughty answer from cacama he then tried threats 
asserting the supremacy of the Spanish emperor. Kakama replied that he acknowledged no such authority. He knew nothing of the Spanish sovereign or his people, nor did he wish to know anything of them. Cortez then invited Kakama to come to Mexico to discuss their differences, but Kakama had no faith in Spanish loyalty, and he replied that when he did visit the capital, it would be to rescue it, as well as the emperor himself, and their common gods, from bondage. He should come, not with his hand upon his breast, but on his sword, to drive out the Spaniards who had brought such disgrace upon the country. While this had been going on, Montezuma had still further forfeited all claim to sympathy by the willingness with which he accepted the attentions of those who were, in fact, his jailers. They paid him all the outward marks of respect, pretending still to regard him as a powerful sovereign, and he, in return, was present at their exercises and sports, took the greatest interest in two ships they were building for navigation on the lake, and in all respects behaved to them as if they were his best friends. He now carried his baseness still further, and informed Cortez that several of the Tezcucan nobles were regularly in his pay, and that it would be easy through them to capture Kakama and thus break up the Confederacy. Cortez at once took means to carry out the suggestion. The traders invited Kakama to a conference at a house overhanging the lake near Tezcuco. Upon going there, he was seized by them, bound, placed in a boat, and carried to Mexico. He was there brought before Montezuma. In spite of the perils of his position, Kakama bore himself nobly. He boldly accused his uncle of foul treachery, and with the cowardice which he had betrayed since the Spaniards had entered his kingdom. Montezuma handed him over to Cortez, who ordered him to be loaded with fetters and thrown into a dungeon. The emperor then issued an order declaring that Kakama had forfeited his sovereignty by his rebellion, and that he therefore deposed him, and appointed a younger brother named Kuitkuatska in his place. The other leaders of the Confederacy were all seized by the orders of Montezuma in their own cities, and brought in chains to the capital, where they were imprisoned with Kakama. Upon Roger, the news of Kakama's arrest and imprisonment came like a thunderclap. He was in the habit of frequently seeing Malincha, who still retained the warm feeling of friendship for him that had originated at Tabasco, and with whom he often had long talks of their life in those days. But she had let no word drop as to the doings of Kakama. She had questioned him somewhat closely as to his relations with that prince, and he had made no secret to her of the fact that Kakama had promised him his sister's hand in marriage. As many of the Spaniards had already married the daughters of great caziques, this appeared to her natural, and she had congratulated him upon the prospect of an alliance which would bring him wealth and land, but had said that, for the present, it would not do to think of marriage, as it would be unsafe for him to leave the capital. When, therefore, Roger heard of the misfortune that had befallen Kakama, he was filled alike with surprise and consternation, and, hurrying to Malincha, begged her to use her influence with Cortez to spare the young prince's life. I have already done so, she said, and he has promised that no blood shall be shed, though the chiefs who have leaked themselves with Kakama must all be imprisoned. The safety of the army requires it. No harm, however, shall befall Kakama, of that be assured. I may tell you now that it has been settled that his brother, Kuakuitska, shall be appointed Lord of Tezcuco in his place. This will be done by a decree to-morrow. Malincha, I must go at whatever hazard to warn Kakama's wife and sister in order to give them the opportunity of leaving the palace before this young prince arrives. Pray obtain for me leave from Cortez to go away for twenty-four hours. You can tell him of the interest I have in the matter. I will manage it for you, Malincha said. 
but as your princess is also sister to the new king i see no reason for uneasiness she is devoted to kakama roger replied and would not i feel sure consent to remain in the palace with the usurper you had best advise her malinche said with a little nod of the head to disguise her sentiments and make the best of the matter it may make you know a good deal of difference in the amount of dowry you will get with her i am not greedy malinche roger said but the present is at any rate no time for talking of marriage most of the officers have married malinche said they may have done so but they are officers and can maintain their wives in all honor and respect and have apartments allotted to them here i have neither rank nor station and shall certainly not ask my princess to share my rough quarters as a soldier there is no hurry as i told you but a year ago malinche i am scarcely out of my boyhood and there will be plenty of time when matters settle down and we see what is going to happen to think of marrying i will go and speak to cortez at once and get leave for you but you had best disguise yourself well tezcuco will be in an uproar tonight for the capture of kakama will be known there ere many hours if it is not known already she soon returned with the required permission this time roger dressed himself in the attire of a traitor as being less likely to attract attention malinche again secured a boat for him and having dyed his face and hands he started at once as it would be dark before he reached tezcuco since montezuma had been captive in their hands there was no longer any fear of an attack being made upon the spaniards and the soldiers were now able to come and go through the town at pleasure upon landing roger at once made his way to the palace there was great excitement in the town the people were assembled in crowds discussing the news that had reached them and even at the palace gate the guards were careless of their duty and roger entered without question he hurried direct to the royal apartments an official who would have barred his way allowed him to pass at once when he recognized his identity when he entered he found a scene of grief and confusion the queen was extended upon a couch weeping bitterly while amentia and some of her ladies although themselves weeping were trying to console her the princess gave a cry of joy when she saw him and running forward threw herself into his arms you have heard the news she exclaimed kakama is lost these monsters will put him to death i can reassure you as to that roger said he is a captive but his life is not in danger malinche has interceded for him and cortez has promised that his life shall be spared a cry of gladness burst from all present i have other and less pleasant news to give you amentia roger whispered in her ear get rid of all these ladies my news must be for you only a minute or two later the queen dismissed her ladies the news i have to tell you roger went on is that tomorrow montezuma will issue a decree deposing kakama and appointing kuakuitska lord of tezcuco an exclamation of anger and indignation broke from the queen and amentia he cannot do it the latter exclaimed passionately it is beyond his power the emperor has a voice in the council but beyond that he has no power to make or unmake the lords of tezcuco at the present moment roger said gravely he has got the spanish power at his back or rather he is but the mouthpiece of the spaniards they are the masters and care nothing for the law or usages of your country the tezcucans will not receive kuakuitska amentia said every one knows that he is weak and cowardly and of late he has been at mexico dancing attendance on the spaniards they will never receive him the queen raised her head from the couch we must not build on that amentia he comes sent here by the whites and when mexico dares not rise against them you may be sure that the people here will not dare to provoke their anger besides who have they to lead them was not kakama betrayed by his own nobles let us send for kuitcatl and hear what he advises us 
Cuitcatl, on his arrival, was so thunderstruck on hearing that Montezuma had so debased himself to the Spaniards as to depose his own nephew, whose only fault was patriotism, and who had been endeavoring to effect his rescue, that he was for a minute or two speechless with indignation. The gods have indeed deserted us, he said, when they have turned a monarch who was considered brave and honorable into a base slave. May their vengeance fall upon him. May the curse of our ruined country descend upon the man who is the real author of our misfortunes. Do you think, Cuitcatl, Amencha asked, that the people will receive this usurper? I fear indeed that they will do so, he replied. Montezuma has appointed him, and Montezuma's name still has power. At any rate, it will afford them an excuse for submission. Besides, how could they fight when so many of their own nobles are treacherous? Doubtless Kalkama will not be the only victim, and Montezuma will, at the orders of the Spaniards, disgrace all who have acted with him. Then what would you advise us to do? We are both resolved that we will not wait the coming of this usurper. My house is at your service, Cuitcatl said. It lies, as you know, near the foot of the hills, and whatever strife may go on here, its quiet is little likely to be invaded. Kuikuitska will not concern himself at present with you, nor would he venture to take any hostile steps against you, for did he do so, it would excite a storm of indignation. As to you, princess, as his own sister, and of the royal blood, you could, if you liked, stay here, as at present, and, indeed, were it not that I am sure you would not leave the queen, I should advise you to do so, for you might then act in the interests of Kakama, should you see an opportunity. Amentia shook her head. No, she said, brother though he is, I would not bend my head before a usurper, while Kakama lives. When do you think we had better leave here? I should say it were best to leave at once, Kuitcatl replied. I will order three or four litters to be prepared for yourselves and, say, two of your most trusted attendants. Bethalda will find in the town men on whom he can rely to take you. In this way none here will know where you have gone. I will have the litters in readiness at a short distance from the palace, and you can then issue out by the garden gate unobserved. I shall, of course, myself escort you. What shall we take with us, Cuitcatl? I will get, in addition to those who carry the litters, five or six porters. These I will bring up through the gardens to the private door, and Roger and I will carry down to them such parcels of your clothes as you may make up. I should then make up two large caskets with your own jewels, those of Kokama, and some of the most valuable stones and jewels from the royal treasury leaving all the royal ornaments worn on state occasions, so that the usurper will not know that any have been abstracted. I would rather take nothing but my own and Kokama's personal jewels, the queen said. The contents of the whole treasury are his, by rights, and you must remember, madame, that jewels may be very useful to you. You will have to work for Kakama, and unhappily there are many who are not insensible to bribes and the possession of valuable jewels may enable you to be of great assistance to the king. I did not think of that, the queen said. Yes, you are right. There is a hoard stowed away by the late king and by his father before him. Its existence is known only to my husband and myself. I have never seen it, but Kakama tells me that it is of immense value, and was to be used only in case of an extreme emergency and danger to the state. We can take what we choose from this separate hoard, and Kuakuitska will find, from the list in the hands of the chief of the treasury, that the royal store is untouched. That will be vastly better indeed, Kuitkatl said. It is well that he should have no possible cause of complaint against you. Where is this hidden receptacle? Before I show it to you, I will send all our attendants to bed, save the two we will take with us, my own maid and Amentia's. I will be going. Roger Hawkshaw will help you, 
cuitcatl said it will take some time for bathalda to get the litters and the men it is now ten o'clock in three hours the litters shall be outside the little gate of the garden and i will bring six porters to the private door at the foot of the stairs that will be enough the queen said two will be ample for our garments and you and roger hawkshaw can take the jewels which when we start can go in the litters with us cuitcatl left the two ladies who were to accompany the party were then called in and informed of what had taken place and that they had been chosen to accompany the queen and princess in their flight tell all the others the queen said that we are overcome with the news we have received and will dispense with all further attendance except your own for the night when all is quiet make up your jewels and such clothes as you may wish to bring in bundles then go to the wardrobe room and make up two bundles each as much as a man can carry of my garments and two of the same size of those of the princess take all our jewels out of the caskets and put them in with our clothes when the two waiting ladies had retired the queen said to roger now come with me and we will open the treasure closet the palace was by this time hushed and quiet the greater part of the courtiers had long since left having hurried away to their homes when the news came of cacama's arrest and the remainder had gone to friends in the town or neighborhood as it was thought probable that the spaniards might at once send a force to take possession of the palace and arrest all found there taking some keys from a strong coffer in cacama's room and bidding roger take a torch from the wall the queen led the way to the royal treasury a massive door was first unlocked and in a large room were seen ranged vessels of gold and silver strong boxes containing gold necklaces armlets and other ornaments while on lower shelves were bars of gold and silver ready to be worked up they passed through this room into another the same size around it ran deep shelves in which were piled the treasury papers with the accounts of the royal revenues and the tributes paid by the various cities and villages and landowners of the kingdom in one corner stood a small cupboard of about four feet high also filled with papers the queen put her hand inside and touched a small spring at the back now she said to roger pull at that corner of the cupboard he obeyed her instructions and at a vigorous pull the cupboard which had appeared solidly embedded in the wall swung round on one of its angles nothing however was to be seen save a bare wall behind it now roger hawkshaw take your dagger and cut away that plaster for it is but plaster though it looks like stone roger obeyed the task was an easy one for the plaster was but half an inch thick and came off in flakes showing a massive copper door three feet six in height and three feet in width behind it no keyhole was visible press upwards against the lintel the queen said that will release the catch of the door roger did so and at the same moment pushed with his shoulder against the door and it swung round with ease do you enter first with the torch and we will follow the queen said roger found himself in a room about twelve feet square at the farther end was a pile of gold bars four feet deep and as much high extending right across the room on the floor along the other two sides were ranged a number of large chests open these the queen said the gold is of no use to us the chests were full of manufactured gold ornaments many of them studded with jewels roger was astounded at the amount of wealth thus stored away cacama told me the queen said that even the treasure-houses of montezuma are poor in comparison to the treasure his grandfather and father stowed away here and i can well believe it you have not opened that small chest yet this was opened and was found to contain a number of bags which were full of pearls turquoise and other precious stones of large size and immense value we will take this chest away as it stands the queen said it would be awkward to carry roger objected it is very heavy 
and its shape would tell at once that it contained valuables the contents do not weigh many pounds and could easily be wrapped up in a cloth and put into one of the litters without exciting observation if you will allow me i will go back to one of the sleeping rooms and fetch two or three thick rugs he hurried away and in a few minutes returned the bags were transferred from the chest to one of the rugs he had brought which was then wrapped round and tied into a bundle on two other rugs were placed heaps of necklaces and other ornaments from the larger chests until each contained as nearly as roger could guess by lifting them some sixty pounds weight of gold ornaments these were similarly tied up and the three bundles were then carried out from the hidden room and conveyed to the apartment they had before left roger then went back to the treasury closed the copper door swept up and placed in a rug every particle of plaster and then swung the cabinet back into its position where it fastened with a loud click so firmly was it fixed that although roger tried with his whole strength it did not shake in the slightest and the work was so admirably done that from the closest inspection he was unable to discern aught that would have shown that the cabinet was not built into the wall he then returned to where the ladies were waiting him the queen urged him to take two or three of the bags of jewels but this he absolutely refused to do i am acting as kakama's friend he said and as the promised husband of his sister and i should feel myself degraded indeed were i to receive even one of those jewels but there is no saying when we shall meet again the queen said there is no knowing what terrible events may occur whatever occurs lady i shall see you again if i live roger said if not of what use are the jewels to me at the appointed hour kuitcatl returned all is in readiness he said the two attendants were summoned from the apartments where they had been waiting roger and his friend first carried down the bundles of clothing and then took up the rugs containing the heavy gold ornaments roger taking in addition the small parcel with the jewels the attendants then took up their own bundles and the whole party proceeded downstairs and out into the garden kuitcatl led the way with the queen roger followed with amentia the two ladies with the porters came behind how strange roger said last time i came at night through this garden i was a fugitive and you came down to bid me farewell now it is you who have to fly when shall we meet again the girl sobbed i cannot tell you dear but if i live we will meet again things may right themselves yet and at least whatever happens to this unfortunate country we may be happy together i have a good friend in malincha and if the spaniards conquer cortez will certainly give me leave to marry you it is his policy to marry his soldiers to the daughters of mexicans if cortez fails and the spaniards are finally driven out cacama will recover his own again and can then proclaim that i am not of spanish birth and can give you to me so you see that whatever comes there is hope that things will go happily with us i am afraid roger i fear there is to be no happiness in this unfortunate country then we must leave it together roger said cheerfully you are naturally depressed now and see things in their darkest light but you will grow more hopeful again when you are once established in kuitcatl's home arrange with him for bethalda to act as messenger between us he is faithful and brave and will manage to reach me whatever comes of it a few minutes later they were beyond the gardens the four litters stood ready the queen and princess and the two ladies took their seats in them and the three bundles of valuables were also placed inside i shall love you i shall love you until death amentia sobbed out and then the procession moved away leaving roger standing by himself skirting the outside wall of the garden he made his way to the shore of the lake he found the boatmen asleep in their canoe as soon as he aroused them they seized their paddles and on his taking his seat pushed off there is no occasion for speed he said it is but two o'clock now 
and it is of no use our reaching mexico until daybreak for the gates of the palace will be closed and there will be no getting in dressed as i am until sunrise they therefore paddled quietly across the lake often resting for a considerable time and so arranging that they approached the city at the same time as a number of market boats from the villages on the lake well malinche asked with a smile as he met her in one of the courts as he entered and where is your lady love i have not brought her here he said rather indignantly you did not suppose that i was going to bring her back to a barrack room i am not an officer to have a suite of apartments to myself besides if i could have had the whole palace to myself i should not have asked her to forsake her sister-in-law in her distress the two have fled together and when the usurper arrives there to-day he will find that no one knows where they have gone however i hope he will not trouble himself about them after having taken kakama's place he could hardly wish to have kakama's wife there and i think he will be very glad when he hears that she has left can i see kakama i should like to tell him that his wife is in safety i will take you with me malinche said i saw him yesterday when he was brought before montezuma he is a gallant prince and i grieve that misfortune has befallen him malinche led the way to the prison-room where kakama was confined the sentries at the door passed her and her companion without hesitation for they knew that her influence was supreme with cortez and that orders did not apply to her i will come again for you in half an hour she said as the sentry unbolted the door kakama was lying on a couch covered with rough mats he sat up as the door opened and leaped to his feet with an exclamation of satisfaction when he saw who his visitor was i have been longing to see you roger he said i knew that you would come to me as soon as you could have you heard that montezuma has deposed me and appointed kuikuitska lord of tezcuco i heard it yesterday afternoon kakama and crossed at nightfall to tezcuco with the news you saw my wife kakama asked eagerly how is she how does she bear the blow she was lost in grief when i first arrived there but the necessity for action aroused her she and amentia agreed that they would not await the coming of the usurper to-day they left the palace secretly under the charge of kuikotl who had litters in readiness for them and started for his house which he placed at their disposal none save two attendants whom they took with them knew that they had left and should the usurper seek for them which kuitcatl agreed with me is not likely to be the case as he will have enough to occupy his time and thoughts it will be long before he can find whither they have gone i must tell you prince that the queen last night opened the secret treasury and took with her a considerable amount of the gold ornaments and the precious stones so that she should have the means if opportunity occur of offering bribes either to the nobles of tezcuco or to your guards here i would i were free but for an hour kakama said passionately i would make an example of the treacherous nobles who betrayed us the queen has done well in going to the secret chamber it was to be kept for an emergency and never was there a greater emergency for tezcuco than now still there were a large number of jewels in the public treasury which she might have taken without breaking in upon the hoard she thought that kuakuitska would on his arrival inquire from the chief of the treasury if everything was untouched if he had found that a large number of valuables had been taken he would connect it with the flight and would at once send in all directions to overtake them whereas if he found that everything were untouched he would think no more of her quite right kakama agreed yes it was certainly better to open the secret chamber it was closed up again i hope for i would not that all the treasure which my father and grandfather stored away should be wasted by kuakuitska or fall into the hands of his greedy friends the spaniards roger informed him of the steps that had been taken and that with the exception of the fact 
that the plaster had been removed, all was exactly as before, and that the entrance could never be discovered unless the cupboard was torn from its place. There is little fear of that being done. All the shelves and fittings of the treasury are of the plainest wood, and offer no inducement to any one to take the trouble to break them down. The treasury might be sacked a dozen times without its occurring to any one to break down that small cupboard in the corner. Roger now told Kakama of the arrangement that had been made that Bathalda should act as messenger between himself and Amentia, and said he doubted not that, on the following day, the man would present himself. "'Have you any message to send to the queen?' he asked. "'Tell her that I am well, and that I am delighted to hear she has left the palace before Kuakuitska arrives. Bid her on no account to try to stir up the false nobles in my favor. They would only betray her to Montezuma. And so long as the Spaniards are masters here, it is useless to think of revolt elsewhere. I do not believe that this will last long. The Mexicans are patient and submissive, but there is a limit, and Montezuma has almost reached it. The time cannot be far off when the people will no longer endure the present state of things here. And when they rise, they will overwhelm these Spanish tyrants, and then I shall be freed. I can wait for a few weeks, and I shall doubtless have companions here ere long. The door now opened, and Malincha, looking in, told Roger that he must leave, as she was required by Cortez, saying good-bye to Kakama, therefore, he returned to his quarters. End of chapter 16